Hello everybody, uh, today I will discuss about the solidification processing in this particular module. So it belongs to this introduction to material processing part 2 actually. Now it is understood that uh, any kind of the metallic material the solidification behavior is very important because the if we try to understand the solidification behavior then it actually directly influence the what is the microstructure usually forms during the material processing of the mainly the metallic materials. And sometimes the solidification controlling of the solidification behavior also to control the macro segregation associated with the and casting uh, process mainly. So that is why it is equally important to understand the solidification behavior. So I will try to give you some brief or basic understanding of the solidification behavior such that we will be able to apply all this uh, understanding uh, to explain the different kind of the uh, microstructure formation or how it can be linked with the defect formation uh, during the processing of the metallic material. So of course solidification means we understand the transition from the liquid phase to solid phase. So any kind of the material when material processing technologies that actually handling the liquid metal. So in that case the solidification behavior is important. So then transition occurs actually from liquid phase to uh, solid phase and it, it usually occurs as a pure one particular temperature the transformation occurs or over a range of the temperature. In case of the pure metal the solidification occurs at melting point temperature but in case of the alloy system the solidification occurs between the solidus and liquidus temperature in that range. But how to start the what we can explain the solidification. So initially we see just follow this figure initially there is a liquid metal and that is the temperature is above the melting point temperature. Now in this it gets the favorable conditions that means somehow if we extract the heat from this container then nucleation at the uh, one particular position the it transform try to transform from the liquid phase to solid phase and but in the form of a through the formation of the nucleus so that is called the nucleation occurs and that nucleation starts forming approximately at the near the melting point temperature. So when small particles form and which is called the nucleation and that is transition from the liquid to the solid phase and gradually and after certain period of the time this particles will try to grow and grow and that is the growth of the small solid particles and this growth phenomena usually occurs below the melting point temperature and once completely liquid transformed to the solid then we can say there is a solidification occurs the complete of the solidification and that usually occurs such bulk temperature of the material should be below the melting point temperature. So that four different conditions or four different steps of the solidification is very clearly mentioned uh, in these figures. Now this basically you are looking into the solidification is the formation of the nucleus and it is also associated what the stability of the nucleus whether this particular nucleus will stable or not or favorable further to grow further to make a complete solidification or solidified component or solidified particles to occur. So now definitely the solidification we are taking is the broadly transition from the liquid phase to solid phase that, but there are lots of things are there to understand the solidification we need to understand the thermodynamic principle for example that what we can count the enthalpy how we can decide the entropy of a system and what we can define the gives free energy available for this particular system all actually matters to understand such that we will be able to link all these thermodynamic parameters or some thermodynamic principle to explain the solidification behavior. Along with that we need to understand the equilibrium phase diagram to some extent overall if we understand the different phases during the solidification to occurs apart from this time temperature transformation diagram and CCT diagram uh, for a a particular material or the or I can say that is a binary alloy system. So it is very uh, under uh, it is very important to understand all the different types of the diagrams and and curves CCTTT and equilibrium phase diagram that will try to explain the different phase formation through the solidification processes. So to do that we start with the basic thermodynamic principles which is very basic things because we have already started probably in the basic thermodynamics course any thermodynamics course. So here we start with the first law of the closed system and if we, we explain that what is the closed system. So there is a system and interaction of the system to the boundary through the surroundings. Now suppose there is a come amount of the heat transfer to the system. So Q we define Q to the system thermodynamic system 
and there is a work done amount of the work done by the system equal to w and certain amount of the energy stored within the system so that is called the internal energy of the system so first law of thermodynamics for a closed system says that total input q equal to should be equal to the work done by the system and stored energy or internal energy of the system so q equal to delta e plus w this is the basic principle of the uh, first law of thermodynamics so this is basically energy principle it is try to explain this thing now for the parameter this thing that uh, enthalpy enthalpy of a system is basically at a particular point the total enthalpy of a system is basically equivalent to the total amount of the internal energy of the system plus the status of the pressure and volume of the system so p into v indicates what is the the feasibility of the work done by this particular system so over at a state this h enthalpy is a consists of the internal energy as well as the what is the capability of the system to do the work done so that is work done we know that pressure into volume that indicates the work done uh, of the system now change of the enthalpy change of the enthalpy can be written like that dh equal to de change of the internal energy into d of pv so pv can be changed either change of the pressure at constant volume or change of the volume at constant pressure both are there so we can further expand pd uh, d of pv equal to pdv in plus vdp now usually one system or one thermodynamic system happens as constant pressure say at atmospheric pressure there is no variation of the pressure in that case we can say the change of pressure should be zero so at constant pressure we can further modify this equation d is equal to de plus pdv pdv work done and which is equivalent to the delta q change of the heat supply to the system or amount of the heat transfer to the system so de internal energy pdv work done that is equivalent to the delta q now for a finite process at constant pressure and there is a change of the from one state to another state uh, with the application of the heat energy to the system uh, so this is uh, assuming that d into pdv equal to del q so total q heat transfer to the system q the change of the state from one state to another state so 1 to 2 integration of the dh here is the enthalpy change that should be h2 minus h1 and that is equivalent to the that we can say delta h so that means total heat transfer is basically to the system cause changing of the state from state 1 to state 2 and that corresponds to the change of the enthalpy delta h now we see the second law of the closed system if we apply the second law of thermodynamics for the closed system the complete conversation of the work or heat energy into the in terms of the work heat into work in a cyclic process is not possible so heat and work are not completely interchange interchangeable forms of the energy so we cannot 100 percent convert from the heat energy to the in terms of the work done so it means that's why the one system uh, having the 100 percent efficiency is actually not possible so here that is the interpretation of the the second law of the thermodynamics so it means that but if you look into the total process as far to the aspect of the second law of thermodynamics there might be the reversible process or ideal process another is the irreversible or the natural process so all natural process is actually irreversible process but we sometimes we explain the reversible process that is very ideal process so we explain the ideal process because we take this as a reference of the ideal process to explain or understand the reversible irreversible or natural processes so this is the basics first law and second law of thermodynamics now we try to look into the entropy of a system so entropy of a system is basically interpretation of the entropy is kind of the disorderness or the randomness of a system is interpreted by the entropy now mathematically you can see the change of the entropy ds is basically greater than or equal to dq by t so when is the dq is the amount of the heat transfer to the system at a particular temperature t ratio of that uh, indi indicates the uh, increase of the uh, entropy or change of the entropy from one state to another state so it's basically change of the entropy you can say the s2 minus s1 is basically greater than equal to dq by t it means that with the application of the heat energy to the system uh, at a particular temperature that will bring some uh, randomness or disorderness to the system and that randomness or disorderness of the disorder of the system is measured by the change of the entropy and that is linked in the to the transfer of the heat to the system at constant temperature now if we look that 
in a isolated system so isolated system which does not undergo any kind of the inter energy interaction with the with the surroundings because it's an isolated system so in isolated system there is no it may not it should not uh, interact with the energy to the to the surroundings with the other system surrounding system so therefore in that case the energy uh, heat energy transfer dq equal to 0 so that's why we can say for the ds d equal to 0 ds for isolated system it should be greater than equal to 0 because dq equal to 0 for an isolated system because it does not undergo any kind of the energy interaction with the surroundings so that is the characteristics of an isolated system now for a reversible process or i can say the ideal process in this case also di uh, for isolated system in that case also di is equal to 0 because it is a reversible process. So, in case of the reversible process, it should be that d s equal to 0, we can this thing. So, here s equal to constant. So, it means that for an reversible process or ideal process, the entropy remains a constant. Now, for an irreversible process, but in case of the irreversible process, we can say that d iso i for an isolated system, but if we consider this as an irreversible process, in that case, it d s change of the entropy for an isolated system should be greater than 0 uh, for an reversible process. So, this is the basic understanding of the what is the accounting the change of the uh, entropy in a particular system and we are all we are explaining in terms of the for an isolated system. Now, for an it means that we for an isolated system that uh, entropy of an isolated system can never decrease. It means that entropy and isolated system will always be increasing. So, it will not uh, never decreases, but it always increases for a natural process that means but for a natural process the entropy will always uh, increase for a natural process so this is the entropy principle so that is the this entropy principle i have tried to explain you because the by different the entropy and using this or considering the reference as an isolated system and with this as for an isolated system if there is no heat transfer to the system then what are the entropy change will will be accounted and that entropy change will be accounted for the different way if it is a completely isolated system and but for a reversible process and for an irreversible process so we understood that in any natural process that for a natural process the entropy will always increase now if we consider the universe as an isolated system and the isolated system which consists of the system as well as the surroundings so consists of this thing now for an isolated system we can see that d universe would be greater than or equal to 0 change of the uh, entropy in this case this uh, universe isolated system which which is consist of the system for example d s system change of the entropy of the system plus d s with the surroundings so we can just separate of the system so for example this is the uh, universe now this is the system and uh, this is the uh, surrounding and this is the system so this we consider as an isolated system now this is the system and it is interact with the surrounding so d isolated overall system that should be greater than or equal to 0 but it consists of the two different system the one is the universe consists of the one of the system as well as the surrounding so that's why this should be greater than or equal to 0 for the in case of the universe as an isolated system so it means that but we say that uh, of a particular system that is a isolated system the entropy greater than or equal to 0 but I am not talking about the equal to 0 because it is a very ideal situation but at least it should be greater than 0 for an irreversible process. Now we can say that of course there might be it is a consist of the two components so it will always be greater than 0 so it means that entropy will always increase but point is that entropy may decrease as the locally in some point but it must be compensated such that total entropy change should be greater than 0. So therefore net effect of an irreversible process is an entropy increase in the whole system in case of the irreversible system the entropy will always increase the entropy increase of an isolated system is a measure of the extent of the irreversibility of the process undergone by the system because we say the d change of the entropy is, is greater than equal to 0 greater than 0 this is the natural process but r equal to 0 that is the uh, reversible process so here this indicates it should be greater than 0 but how much uh, it means that it is a qualitative way that it indicates the extent of irreversibility of the system is basically the change of the entropy is a uh, some way represents the extent of the randomness 
of this particular system, a natural system. Now, once you understand the entropy, then we try to look into the Gibbs free energy. Gibbs free energy represents like that Gibbs free energy of a state, the G equal to H. So, H is the enthalpy of the system minus T into S, temperature into entropy uh, of the system. Now, here the utilization of the, the reversible ideal process. So, in ideal process, we know ds equal to dq by t. So, it means that q equal to t into s here, total q equal to t into s. But remember, the t into s means here we are assuming the, the increment of the entropy at constant temperature t. So, here q equal to t into s. So, when we put it q equal to t into s, uh, this is another expression, this is one expression, H equal to enthalpy, T equal to absolute temperature, S is the entropy and that is the measure of the randomness of the system. Now, H equal to enthalpy of the system, here you can see the enthalpy heat content of the system can be represents, it is like that H equal to E plus PP that we have already seen. So, DH equal to DE plus PDP plus VDP, that means change of the enthalpy in terms of the change of the inter, uh, internal energy or that work done by the system either by changing the pressure or either by changing the volume of the system. So, now internal energy is the measure of this thing in case of I think is the internal energy represents in the easily microscopic in nature mode. So, energy stored in the molecule and the atomic structure uh, depends on the atomic structure of the system. So, in that uh, the internal energy represents this thing, but internal energy can be the total kinetic and the potential energy of the atoms of the system that, that is the representation of the internal energy of the system. Now, in case of the solid and liquid which is we know the relatively condensed the solid and the uh, liquid phases. In that case, this change of the PV term is very small as compared to the E. So, in case of the solid, so therefore, change of the PV term. So, del P and del V is relatively very small in case of the solid which is basically condensed phase. So, therefore, we can say if there is a change of the this term, if make it as a 0 in case of the solid, then internal energy of uh, enthalpy of a system is approximately H equal to E. So, approximately d h equal to d e because other terms are 0 in this case. So, h equal to a is quite reasonable in case of the its value in case of the solid or the liquid. So, representation of d h equal to d e p d v that we have already seen on the expression. Now, here we can say that enthalpy of a system is equivalent to the heat content uh, within a system and that is true in case of the uh, solid. Now, this system is in equilibrium when it is in the most stable state definitely we can say one system is in equilibrium uh, conditions and then we can say it is equilibrium condition mean maintaining the equilibrium condition means that system is more stable uh, system that means uh, more stable system means that until or unless there is no external kind of pressure force or energy supplied to the system you know it will not change the state from one state to another state or there's very small changes of the uh, state that means temperature, pressure, internal energy to the system may not able to change the stability of the system. So, based on that, uh, that we can say that when it is in the system is equilibrium, uh, uh, it under equilibrium conditions, if condition is the system is very stable. So, therefore, at constant temperature and pressure, we can see a closed system will be stable equilibrium. One closed system which will be stable equilibrium at constant temperature and pressure that has the lowest possible value of the Gibbs free energy because we see the Gibbs free energy is equal to H into Ts, temperature this thing. So, so Gibbs free energy, the lowest possible Gibbs free energy is possible if the uh, lowest values of the Gibbs free energy is possible if lowest value of the H and the highest value of the T into S. If this is the uh, conditions, then this the we can always reach try to reach the lower values of the Gibbs free energy. So, low value of the Gibbs free energy indicates the stability of the uh, system. So, we will discuss further what we can make the stability of the system for the solid and the stability of the system in case of the liquid. So, mathematically we can say that g equal to h into t s, but mathematically see d g it tends to 0 or equal to 0, then we can say that it is a more stable system. But we see the d g equal to d h into t d s and t is the that particular we are not varying the temperature here, but one constant temperature there is a variation of the entropy equal to d s. So, now if we want to make d g try to make 0, uh, that means is the d g equal to 0, the change of the Gibbs free energy 0, it means that the system is more stable. Now, here you can see that from the figure we can see the most stable equilibrium. 
So, for example, one solid or liquid having certain atomic arrangement such that it will reach the equilibrium condition and here you can say d is equal to 0. Here you see that different arrangement of the atoms. So, different level of the stability can be reached uh, by the system. So, here you see that here the more stable the change of the Gibbs energy equal to 0 at this particular point because uh, at this particular we can see the slope equal to 0 here also. Similarly, it can reach the another configuration of the atoms. Here also you can see the Gibbs energy might be 0 also. So, we mean to say that it might have the several minimum points and each and every minimum point where d is equal to 0 that indicates the one particular configuration of the atoms it will try to reach the equilibrium conditions. So, therefore, stable equilibrium condition indicates uh, d is equal to 0, but we see that configuration B and it can further reach to another configuration of the atom A, so which is more stable in this case. So, configuration B we can say it is the metastable state as compared to the configuration A, but in this case the configuration A it reaches the another most stable equilibrium state. So, like that it can reach the several other stable equilibrium states, but mathematically you can see it will try to reach always the d g equal to uh, 0, that means change of the Gibbs energy should be 0, it always corresponds to the stable equilibrium. Uh, condition, but how we can utilize this thing to explain the, the stability of the different phases here. So, we see that at low temperature, so at low temperature the solid phase are more stable because they have the strongest atomic bond. So, we know that solid phase having strongest atomic bond, so in that sense it is having the stability having at the lowest temperature. So, means that lowest internal energy of the system. It means that dh dg dg equal to should be less either dh equal to z and this will be higher side. But at the low temperature this value we consider the more driving force to bring the stability of a system is basically low values of the enthalpy. So, uh, because for in case of the solid this randomness is actually in this case this randomness can be very this high and even temperature also very low because solid exists at the low temperature. So, at very low temperature this is the enthalpy is the uh, dominating factor to represent the, the stability of the system. So, that is why a low temperature solid phase is more stable because it is having the lowest internal energy of the internal energy of the system because in lowest internal energy of the system because the atomic bonding is very strong at the low temperature that is why it represents the internal energy of the system is the low. So, that is why solid phase is more stable at the, the low temperature. Similarly, at high temperature in this case this T s term, so T s term is the more dominating factor here. So, if the T s term becomes very high in case of at high temperature. So, therefore, T s term dominates and the phases with the more freedom of atom movement. So, phases can the more freedom to move movement of the atom. So, here that is why at the high temperature liquid and gaseous phases are the most stable because at high temperature this T s term is basically become very high as compared to the H. So, that is why G is more relate at the T s term depending of the T s term at the for liquid and gases, but G is dependent or H is basically at the in case of the uh, solid phase. So, that is why liquid and gases are more stable at the relatively high temperature. Now, of course, all these cases we consider the pressure as a uh, constant that means uh, everything is happening over a constant pressure, but if pressure changes we are considered then phases with the small volume. So, phases having the small volume are favored to reach the equilibrium at very high pressure. So, at very high pressure the phases having the very small volume they will try to reach the equilibrium if we consider the pressure changes happens in a in a system. So, here you see that depending upon there are so many infinite number of atomic arrangement may happen and each and every arrangement of the atoms it may reach the different level of the equilibrium state because all this equilibrium state represents the change of the Gibbs energy equal to 0 all these cases. So, this is the experience. Now, overall we can see look back with the thermodynamic relations uh, to relate the uh, different uh, enthalpy of a system as well as the H and the Gibbs energy of a system how to represent graphically. See the x axis represents the temperature and y axis one side is the enthalpy positive side and y axis negative side indicates the Gibbs energy. So, even we see that we start from here. So, here this curve is basically represents the, the enthalpy of the system at the, as a function of temperature and this curve represents the 
this gives energy of a system. If you see over the temperature, at the temperature is increasing, then gives energy actually decreases. That means more negative value. So gives energy actually decreases with increasing the temperature. It means that that we know that temperature means the higher temperature. If we make a boundary here, that the assuming the higher temperature, which represents the existence of the liquid and gases, that becomes more stable because the gives energy is very low. Low temperature site. In this case, the the solid phase is more stable at the low temperature site because in this case is the Gibbs energy is, is the lower but uh, not the lowest in the like liquid and the uh, gaseous phases. So mathematically you can see that G equal to H minus T S enthalpy and minus T S the temperature and entropy. So D G equal to D H minus D T S we can see D G equal to D A D Q in this case we see that enthalpy is equal to dh is equal to dq but at constant pressure that we have already seen that at constant pressure dh is equivalent to dq now dts dt into s minus t into ds so therefore dt into s and t into ds we have seen that at equilibrium condition ds equal to dq by t so t into ds is basically dq so here you can see t into ds dq at constant pressure so this and this are balanced. So d is equal to minus s dt. So dg by dt equal to minus s. But all is happening at constant pressure. So here we see constant pressure. We are getting dg by dt equal to minus s. So slope of this curve. This is x axis and this is y axis. We can slope indicate dy by dx. But in this case the slope equal to the here g y axis g and x axis is the temperature t. So here dg by dt represents the slope. So at any point the slope is basically indicates slope equivalent the slope equal to minus s here again the slope indicate the minus s similarly the in case of the enthalpy curve here the h versus temperature t so dh by dt at constant pressure that actually indicates the specific heat so slope is represented by the uh, specific heat we know the dh equal to cp into dt here the specific heat at constant pressure so that's why the slope of the enthalpy curve represents the specific heat of the system. Now we see variation of the HAG with temperature for the solid and the liquid phase. Here we can see the in case of the pure metal. Solid and liquid phase in case of the pure metal we can see this is the, uh, the, the solid line that represents the enthalpy curve for the solid phase and dotted line indicates the enthalpy curve for the liquid phase. Similarly, here this line indicates the this Gibbs energy for the solid phase. Another the dotted line started with the Gibbs energy for the liquid phase. And where we can see that at all t liquid has a higher enthalpy. So basically, liquid has a higher enthalpy than the solid, irrespective of the any temperature. See, this is the melting point temperature. So melting point this is a phase transition occurs from the liquid phase to the solid phase. And uh, uh, here you see the solid line, there is a change of the phase. So that means enthalpy increasing from the solid phase to liquid phase here increment and that indicates the liquid phase uh, enthalpy so, of the system. Similarly, we see that irrespective of the any temperature, the enthalpy for the solid uh, liquid phase is higher as compared to the solid phase. In case of the solid, the Gibbs energy is lower than that of the liquid phase. But once it's crossed the melting point temperature, then it becomes a liquid because this side is the liquid phase. So liquid phase, here you can see the solid line indicates the this uh, Gibbs energy for the liquid phase. So here Gibbs energy is the lower than that of the solid phase. So therefore above the melting point temperature, the Gibbs energy of the liquid phase is lower than that of the solid phase. So here the liquid phase is more stable as compared to the solid phase above the melting point temperature and that we can see from the Gibbs energy curve. But at the low temperature below the melting point temperature we can see the Gibbs energy for the solid phase is lower than that of the liquid phase. So that's why here the solid phase is more stable at the below the melting point temperature. Now G for the liquid phase decreases more rapidly with increasing the temperature than at the solid phase. If we see the curve for the G it is the more rapidly increment so that means the the slope is more in case of the uh, liquid phase so that's it increases the more rapidly with increasing the temperature as compared to the uh, solid phase. Now here you can see once we understand that the role of the Gibbs energy to reach the equilibrium phase and at the respective of whether it is a solid phase or the liquid phase we can simply understood that if the Gibbs energy is minimum that indicates the it is the equilibrium phase. So just the thermodynamics which are simply explaining the status of the Gibbs energy we can explain the uh, equilibrium 
for the liquid and the solid phases of a system. Now, for example, here diving force for the solidification we see that we are explaining this is the temperature T and the Gibbs free energy G. For example, in this cases we are indicating this. Now, here the red line is basically Gibbs free energy for the solid and the blue line indicates the Gibbs free energy of the liquid. Now, we see the melting point temperature T and here is the T. Now, we have seen the in the solidification process also the undercooling is the one important feature to look into that actually driving force for the nucleation. That means, this undercooling is required to start the nucleation process from the transforming from the phase liquid phase to uh, solid phase. So, here you can see that even less than the melting point or below the melting point temperature here this is the change of the Gibbs free energy corresponding to that. And beyond the above the melting point temperature you see the Gibbs free energy for the liquid phase is lower as compared to the solid phase. So, here liquid phase is more stable here. So, a liquid metal is undercooled. So, here the temperature difference actually the delta T is basically uh, the T m minus T. This is the degree of undercooling available here. So, this is the degree of undercooling. So, I mean to say that degree of undercooling is much more than delta G is a change of the Gibbs energy is also uh, much more. So, it means that higher degree of undercooling is basically in this cases is the more quickly or is the most uh, the feasible conditions to start the nucleation process during the solidification of a uh, pure metal. So, therefore, more undercooling means associated to more amount of the change of the Gibbs free energy. So, solidification will occur with the decrease in the Gibbs free energy, but when solidification will start gradually the decrease of the Gibbs free energy. So, at the solidification will start exactly at the melting point temperature. So, here Gibbs free energy is very close to 0. So, that means it is a that Gibbs we know we have seen the change of the Gibbs free energy equal to 0 that is the uh, equilibrium phase. So, that means at this when exactly close to 0 the solidification will start at this particular point and it corresponds to the change of Gibbs free energy should decrease. But available free energy is available much more which is very prone to occurs to start the nucleation process when the degree of undercooling is much more or Gibbs free energy amount of the delta G is also much more in this case. Now, free energy decreases provides the driving force for the solidification. So, gradually free energy decreases close to the melting point temperature that actually provides the driving force for the solidification to occurs. So, here you see the this free energy at temperature T for the liquid and the solid or we can see we can G L gives absolute value of the free energy G L is the status of the enthalpy and T into S L. So, we are assuming the at temperature T. Similarly, G S H S minus T S S that means gives free energy for the solid phase H S minus T H S. Now, you can see change of the gives free energy or S S delta G delta G equal to uh, you see that this liquid minus this one this minus this one we can see that delta G equal to delta represent the delta H minus T into delta S such that delta H equal to H L minus H S delta S equal to uh, S L minus S S that means the difference between the the entropy of the liquid to solid phase and difference between the enthalpy of the liquid to solid phase. So, now at equilibrium melting point temperature when with the, uh, the therefore at T m basically solid occurs the free energy of the solid and liquid phase are equal. So, here you see the delta G equal to 0 at equilibrium melting temperature here you can see the delta G equal to 0 at melting equilibrium solid temperature. So, here we make it 0 then we see the equilibrium position, but overall you can see that say delta G equal to delta H minus T m into delta S. So, basically T the solidification occurs T at T equal to T m. So, here T equal to T m the solidification where, where delta G equal to 0 we see that delta H this equation delta H minus T m into delta S equal to 0. From here you can see the delta S equal to at T m melting point temperature delta S equal to delta H by T m. So, delta H the change of the enthalpy which is equivalent to the latent heat here. So, latent heat by T m that is indicates. Now, we can see further at any point very close to the melting point temperature we can estimate the delta G equal to delta H minus T delta S. So, here delta H equal to L we have already calculated delta H equal to L uh, enthalpy uh, change of the enthalpy is equal to the latent heat here L. Now, minus T into L by T m 
So, delta S equal to L by Tm, but delta S L by Tm is close to the melting point temperature. So, here you see the L by Tm and we see the L Tm minus T by Tm. So, here is a Tm minus T is the delta T. So, delta T equal to Tm minus T is the degree of undercooling. So, it indicates and uh, Tm is the melting point temperature. So, here the diving force for the solidification equal to delta G equal to L delta T by Tm. This we can calculate. So, higher up the degree of undercooling is associated to the solidification with more amount of the driving force is to start the nucleation process in case of the solidification. So, here we can approximately calculate what is the driving force uh, for the solidification to occur. But solidification occurs exactly the close to the melting point temperature where the delta G is the change of the Gibbs energy is equal to 0. One practice problem we can see that calculate the Gibbs free energy change of a system during the solidification when a small undercooling. So, we see the delta T equal to 2 Kelvin only. Consider the latent heat is given and the melting point temperature of the system is given. So, we can simply the degree of undercooling is given, latent is also given, melting point also given. From here we can say that delta G the diving force can be calculated L delta T by Tm. We can see the L delta G equal to 879.02 Joule per kg. So, this amount of the diving force is available for the nucleation to occur for the this thermodynamic system. So, simple calculation we can do and we can calculate the what is the Gibbs free energy this free energy available for the solidification. Now, we can further look into that the principle of the solidification here you see that solidification starts when the temperature goes below the liquidus temperature because it when goes below the liquidus temperature it means that it is account some amount of the degree of undercooling is available to the system. Here you see the delta T degree of undercooling is available for the system and that count where we can see this is the driving force for the solidification. Now, the change of the phase from liquid phase to solid phase and we see this is the stable solid is stable phase and above the melting point temperature liquid is the stable phase. And here we see the Gibbs free energy volume free energy change Gibbs free energy delta G V. V means the it say we indicate this is the volume free energy. So, that is the difference between the G L minus G S. So, G L minus G S this is the difference of the free energy and we have already calculated the free energy available, but here representing different because we are, we are considering this as a free energy means is the Gibbs free energy means here the volume free energy. So, that latent heat because latent heat delta T by T m here latent heat we are representing L v and degree of undercooling and the T m. So, this is the amount of the free energy available for the solidification to occur. Now, solidification process is basically two stage we already defined that is one is the nucleation and another is the growth stage. Now, there is another division homogeneous nucleation and heterogeneous nucleation process. The homogeneous nucleation process new phases form uh, usually uniformly throughout the parent phase. So, throughout the liquid phase the uniformly the nucleation will start and that is called the homogeneous nucleation process. But heterogeneous nucleation process nucleus from preferably at structural inhomogeneity, inhomogeneity than some kind of the existing particles from where the nucleation will start. So, that is why in uh, homogeneous nucleation process degree of undercooling is much more to start the nucleation process, but in case of the heterogeneous nucleation process since it needs some external aid to start the nucleation process. So, driving force requirement is less here to start the nucleation process and we can see mathematically that what are the driving force required for the homogeneous nucleation as well as the heterogeneous nucleation process. So, we can represent like that this is the liquid phase and there is a solid nucleus will try to form and once the solid nucleation forms it creates the interface. So, interface the surface area equal to 4 pi r square we are assuming the spherical shape where the volume equal to 4 by 3 pi r cube. Now, change in the Gibbs free energy when the nuclei form of radius r, we can see the this is the change of the Gibbs free energy. This consists of the uh, volume free energy as well as the surface free energy because when the nucleus form, new nucleus form, it might be having some interface. So, interface will consume some amount of the surface free that counted as a surface free energy and the interfacial energy is surface free energy. We can say that is the surface free energy uh, the per unit area. So, and this is the surface area of the particles and Another this is the volume free energy. We can see the surface free energy will be much more uh, requirement uh, when the, 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 the particle size will be much bigger. But we see the Gibbs free energy we have like a negative sign 4 by 3 pi r cube and delta G b is the free energy per unit volume. Here you can represent the free energy per unit volume and 4 by 3 equal pi r cube is the, the total volume of the particle. And we see that uh, when the nucleation occurs and we have already seen the curve of the Gibbs free energy curve is basically G is gradually decreasing 
and we see that when you try to represent this the Gibbs free energy curve with the lower side and we see the Gibbs free energy is gets gradually decreasing. So, that is why it is a negative sign I put it volume free energy available associated with negative sign, but uh, other cases the surface that the since new interface will be forming it will consume the energy. So, it is the surface energy will be consumed. So, it will be then the positive side. Now, here see that represent the interfacial energy, uh, this is the interfacial energy and this is the this is the, the volume free energy. Interfacial energy is proportional to the R square because it depends on the surface area and volume free energy depends on the volume, it is proportional to the R cube. So, R is the size of the particle and we see the delta G R at a particular radius as a function of R, we see the delta G consisting of the volume free energy and the surface free energy. So, delta G is the volume free energy and surface free energy, we see this is the curve of this thing. Now, it reach always one optimum values of the critical energy. So, this, uh, this is the optimum value of the free energy chain and gradually after that delta G is gradually decreasing order, one increasing and decreasing order. And we can see that one particular the what can be the critical radius of the nucleation we need to find out the point at which the transition changes the rate of change of the Gibbs free energy changes from positive to negative. So, that is why mathematically we can see try to find out the optimum point here d of delta g by dr should be equal to 0 because delta g you are representing is a, as a function of r radi size of the uh, nucleus. So, here if we do this and we calculate you can get the R star is the twice gamma SL by delta GV. So, it is a volume free energy depends on the volume free energy of the system. So, that means free energy available to further the nucleation process and also it depends on the surface free energy. R star is the here the critical size of the nucleus. Now, if R less than R star basically at particular point the system can lower its free energy by dissociation of the solid that means it may not be the cluster of the atoms when it is acting making a critical size of the nucleus, it is not sub, it will not be able to survive to make the reach to the optimum size of the, the, the reach to the critical size of the nucleus. So, therefore, uh, dissolution of the particle solid particles might occur if R equal to less than R star and that means the unstable particle with, with R less than R star and which is known as the cluster or embryo. So, that means when R greater than R star, the free energy of the system will decrease and the its solid grows. So, therefore, in this case, it is referred to as the nuclear. So, when R greater than R star, the critical size more than the size of the cluster size which forms the nucleus, when it is more than critical size, then it is called the nuclear. Even it is less than R star, that is called the embryo or cluster. But at the slope, when R equal to R star, the slope equal to 0. In this case, that indicates the, the size of the critical condition to start the nucleation process. So, it is basically unstable at R equal to R0, but once the R greater than R start, it becomes the stable nuclear and it becomes the stable situation with the surrounding uh, liquid. Now, if you look into that homogeneous nucleation and heterogeneous nucleus, we can see that although critical size for the homogeneous and heterogeneous nucleations are the same, but for the homogeneous nucleation process, the diving force delta G star is basically the is much more as compared to the heterogeneous nucleation. It means that to start the nucleation process, the energy is uh, uh, required to start the nucleus uh, to form the critical size of the nucleus is much more in case of the homogeneous nucleation process, but it is less as compared to the heterogeneous nucleation process. And here also, now once you enter the nucleation process, then we try to look into the different modes of the solidification processing. We see that the when solidification start because solidification start means the formation of the nucleus and there is a so many nu nucleus forms and it will try to grow and make a solid equation front to move one particular direction or basically depending upon the whatever the heat is extracted or the steepest temperature gradient direction it will move. Now, once we understand the nucleation process and then uh, what are the solidification occurs, then overall gross just look into the solidification front what way it can move. So, solidification front can move in the different way, it can form the different shape also. For example, it can form the planar, it can create the cellular form, it can create the columnar dendritic, you can form the equi dendritic form such that the solidification form create the different kind of the structure which is known as the mode of the solidification. So, therefore, with the zone where the dendrite and the liquid phase coexist is called the Mosey zone because we see that for the alloy system the solidification occurs between the solidus and liquidus temperature. So, within the solidus liquidus temperature, so some part will just solidify and some will be the in the till it is the liquid state. But once it is the below the liquid state, in that case uh, uh, that mixture of gradually the mixture of the solid part will uh, 
gradually increases and the liquid part will decreases but below the uh, solidus temperature then com complete solidification will occur. So that is why between the solid and liquid temperature you can say it is a kind of the mossy zone and that is a kind of mixture of the solid and the liquid phase coexist at this particular zone. Now we see the planar interface will occurs. Uh, you see that increasing constitutional supercooling because constitutional supercooling is associated with that that when there is a compositional change in an alloy system during the solidification process that actually accounts the constitutional supercooling there is a might be change in the liquid heat extraction pattern will change because of the high concentration of the solute uh, during the solidification of an alloy system. So therefore, so very high degree of the constitutional supercooling the mass region becomes wide. So, massive zone becomes very wide, the high amount of the constitutional supercooling exists and promoting to the equiex dendritic to nuclear to occur. So, here you can see that, that this indicates the Mussi zone. So, it is very high means the constitutional supercooling is much more. So, that actually try to produce the some kind of the equiex dendritic structure. Here you see that equiex dendritic, dendritic structure but equiex. But less constitutional supercooling it creates the columnar dendritic structure the lesser than that of the columnar dendrite then it can the very small the constitutional supercooling is very small it can the create the cellular kind of the structure and there is no constitutional supercooling it means that the solidification front will move looks like a, as a planar front will try to move this thing so we see that these are the different mode of the the solidification that will helps to understand the what kind of the solidifugous mode is available and what kind of the uh, structure will whether it is dendritic structure, cellular structure, planar structure will form that entirely depends on the constitutional supercooling. And here you can see that increasing constitutional supercooling is this direction and that that creates the different kind of the solidification form. So, constitutional supercooling here you can define that, that due to the compositional solid changes which is it means that resulting in the cooling in the liquid below the freezing point ahead of the solid interface. It means that the resulting the cooling the resulting in the cooling of the liquid in the below at the very low temperature at the ahead of the solid liquid interface and it entirely depends on the that how the compositional changes occurs in front of the just to solid liquid interface. So, here with these changes we can see that different kind of the constitutional supercooling and based on that we can see that the structure planar structure one plane moves cellular structure also moves this kind of the structure we see the columnar dendrite the solid part is actually indicates the solidified component and remaining as a liquid phase. So, it skinners the columnar dendritic structure and consists of the primary and secondary arm also and you see the equiex dendritic structure at form. So, it depends on the this four type of the structure basic solidification modes depends on the the amount of the constitutional supercooling is available uh, to the system. Now, we see get the conditions of the, uh, the whether planar solidification will exist or not that we can uh, quantify this one. So, here we see we can consider the solidification of alloy composition is the C0 at the steady state with the planar solid liquid interface. And here diffusion coefficient of the solute is basically we can consider the DL, R is the growth rate rate of the growth uh, it is uh, G is the temperature gradient available. So, based on that we can see that how constitutional supercooling help to understand the stability of the uh, interface. So, here x axis is the concentration we see the x axis concentration and we can see that between the liquidus and solidus temperature. So, here see the constitutional supercooling is available composition changes here and region of the constitutional supercooling and we represent this one the distance from the solid liquid interface is the x axis and y axis is the temperature T. So, that same part we are representing here, but this indicates the actual slope and here is the slope of the tangent and this slope of the tangent is a change is the because of the presence of the constitutional supercooling zone and that in that slope can be calculated what is the delta T degree of undercooling is available and DL by R. DL means the we see the concentration gradient, but diffusion should occurs in front of the solid liquid interface. So, that is the diffusion coefficients comes into the picture DL and DL by R. We see the unit of the L square by T as the for the diffusion coefficient by R, R is the T by L temperature by length scale. So, here L, L, so L. So, DL by R is basically indicates the in the length scale that is the distance is basically indicates, but actual slope is G. So, actual slope is G means the 
temperature gradient here you can see the temperature gradient dt by dx because this is the distance from the solid liquid interface so here temperature gradient g you see the actual slope is less than delta t by dl by r or g by r equal to delta t by dl so here you can find out the delta t by dl we see the shaded area is the between the constitutional supercooling where the liquid alone is unstable and the solid liquid actually coexist there so therefore the thickness of the boundary layer for the steady state indicates dl by already calculated that is the unit of the length so that actually indicate indicates the boundary layer thickness here so here to avoid the constitutional supercooling that means planar interface will exist if g by r greater than equal to delta t by dl here if, if you see g by r delta t by l because this presence of the constitutional supercooling the, the slope but in case of the in g greater than delta t by dl by r that actually indicates the planar interface exist but other cases this is the other cases the it can be the d, any kind of the mode so therefore we avoid the constant supercooling so if there might not be any constant supercooling if g by r greater than equal to delta t by l where it means that planar interface will be stable if the g by r greater than equal to delta t by dl now planar interface may break down in this case in terms of the dendritic so that one solid cell or dendritics can coexist with this thing so planar uh, structure can break down also it can convert to the solid cell or dendritic structure uh, can form so that means different cellular cell equiex dendritic planar uh, uh, all kind of the uh, cellular uh, dendritic columnar dendritic or equiex structure can form also depending upon the stability condition so therefore we can see that higher g higher g and the lower r higher g lower r means overall g by r ratio is very very high so that leads to the stable solid liquid interface in case of the planar solid liquid interface so very high value of the g and very low value of the r that indicates the planar solid liquid interface will uh, more stable here but other cases if delta t is high this value is high and dl is the lower side that actually means more difficulty for the planar solid liquid interface to exist so in that cases uh, high delta t and low dl that which will always try to prone some kind of the uh, dendritic structure so that means equiex dendritic columnar dendritic or cellular kind of the structure you can see now these are the effect of the stability of the interface and that depends on the mode of the solidification now if you look into the effect of the cooling rate in a structure whether it is a fine structure or the coarse structure will form that actually depends on the cooling rate here you can see temperature gradient g and the growth rate r affect the solidification microstructure that we have already seen and sometimes g by r is also called the solidification parameter that means growth rate and the uh, temperature gradient both are important to decide the solidification behavior we can explain the different solidification behavior also but if we count the g into r that actually represents the cooling rate here rate of the cooling means that theta by g unit of the g into r should be the theta by r is the temperature uh, sorry uh, by time it will be like that so the kelvin per second something like that uh, in si unit the unit for g into r so therefore ratio of the g by r determines the mode of the solidification we can see the g by r whether it is a planar interface or other interface will be that that indicates the mode of solidification and different structure but g into r represent the size of the solidification structure so we can see that the x axis is the r y axis is the g temperature gradient but if you see that different zone that planar because high g by r this side is the high g by r and this side is the low value of the g by r so high g by r is the planar interface is more stable here you can see the planar interface and gradually cellular columnar dendritic and very low values of the g by r that is the equiex kind of the structure we can equiex dendritic structure we can we can expect but this indicates the cooling rates so here the alpha 1 and the higher cooling rate so higher cooling rate represents the alpha 2 is greater than alpha 1 so here the finer structure so different cooling rate is higher so you can expect the very fine structure so here you see that combining this two one is the mode of the solidification g by r is defines and other cases g into r depends the the size of the solidification structure so that's why g r combining of combination of g by r is better to explain the different solidification behavior of a structure
So that's all for the time being. Here I have tried to explain uh, the different, the very basics of the solidification behavior, and that will help to understand the basics of the solidification behavior to explain the uh, in casting process and welding process, and specifically in case of the metallic material. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you.